Good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully, this new way of connecting audio and uh, both from the microphone standpoint and also from the keyboard standpoint is a little bit better than yesterday's uh, experiment. So thank you again all for tuning in and hanging out with me here. I hope you are all uh, staying dry on this terribly rainy day. Um, so piggybacking on yesterday's discussion of 251s, right? Just your 251. We are going to talk about some organ techniques. Some of you have specifically asked about drawbar techniques. How do I utilize drawbars? So that's what these are up here. So we're going to be talking today about creating different sonic palettes, you know, ranging from something that, you know, if you are familiar with the organ player Jimmy Smith, something like... Uh, to the, uh, you know, some rock and roll stuff, like really loud. We're going to be messing around with talking about how to build different tones on your organ, utilize draw bars, what draw bars are, and also I'm going to start to begin the exploration of how to walk a left-hand bass line. So we might split this into two different parts, so we'll see how it goes today. Um, and again, you know, feel free to make comments of things that you guys want to do. Uh, if you are feeling so generous or complied, I did leave my Venmo account there. Uh, we are all starting to uh, scramble to, you know, make ends meet, so not to sound begging. But if you do feel so inclined to donate, uh, please do so. Teaching is one of my main livelihoods, so, you know, if you enjoy what you're saying, spread the love, share with your friends. Feel free. I made these videos all public, so afterwards, please do share it with as many people as you see would like it. You know, hopefully this just inspire some of you to try some new techniques and my fellow keyboards hopefully you learn something and hey if you see something that you want me to learn please share it i am a perpetual student myself so let's talk about first and foremost what are drawbars so i'm gonna stand up here well we have our drawbars so those of you who are unfamiliar with an organ uh right now i'm playing on a hammond sk2 um i do have a full console s uh e111 next to me but i cannot direct in that to my interface so we want to make sure that uh, you have the best possible sound quality. So when you're looking at draw bars, draw bars, there are nine of them. And each one is, <coughs> if you're familiar with the overtone series, uh, horn players and any wind players, we can access overtones. So what is an overtone? Think about uh, a giant sandwich, right? So when you play a note, when I play like a C, okay, oh, let me turn off Leslie here. When I play a C, that's what we call the fundamental. It's the lowest possible wavelength, lowest frequency. So when you hear that possible sound, right, that is what your ear is like, oh, that's a C, oh, that's a D, that's an E. So the piano, any, pretty much any acoustic instrument has the ability to produce that tone. So like when you play a note on saxophone, you play G, that's a G. But if you manipulate your embouchure in a certain way, you will find a, uh, an ability to sometimes move up to a higher note that isn't actually the note that you thought you were playing. For example, if you play like a low C on the saxophone and you move it up, your next, um, uh, your next partial or your next overtone would be one octave higher to a C. So the organ has a unique ability to kind of tap into those with different gradients, and that's what the beauty of draw bars is. So let me kind of go through with the tone of each draw bar. I'm going to be using middle C just as an example. So this is your first draw bar all the way in the far left, and <clears throat> the history of this actually roots back towards the early pipe organs uh, and what they call stops, right? So that was actually controlling the flow of air through these giant pipes. So if you've ever been to some of these old churches, there are a few that are still standing and still fully functioning that are incredible. This is a slightly different mechanism because it's electronically driven rather than manual with actual physical air motion. But if you notice, I, I can't zoom in here, but they talk about the different lengths of piping. So this is your 16-foot pipe. The next one's five and a third feet, eight feet, and so forth, the smallest being one foot. So it's supposed to be representative of the different draw, uh, I'm sorry, the different pipes and how long or how short. So basic physics, right? The longer the pipe, the lower the tone. The shorter the pipe, the higher the tone. So let me run through each one of these draw bars so you can kind of hear the tonal difference of each one. So the first one, your fundamental, that's your C, if I let go of that. Here's your second one. Right, it's a couple octaves higher. Here's your fourth. So if I open all of them up, you notice it's actually a really complex chord. Sometimes you'll hear a fully open draw bar setting, uh, especially like the peak of a rock song. Someone's like, does this big slide up? And then... Personally, it's not a sound that I like. It's a little too grating, a little too harsh. But when we bring it back, the most commonly used draw bar setting is 
dealing with the first four, at least that's the ones that I most commonly use. And again, the beautiful thing about utilizing your draw bars on your organ is that this is how you impart your own unique tone. So a lot of different players have different sound palettes that they like to play with. For me, I usually default to the first four, and I usually take the second one, slide it down to about five or six, because that's your fifth. So listen to it with it all four fully extended. We have just like a C major triad. And if I remove the second draw bar, it's a little less. So it adds this big, rich fullness to it. Now, as a result, you know, you can start to move them around as you're playing. And this is, if you notice, if you've ever seen videos of me playing or you come out to a show, and thank you again for those of you who do frequent the shows that I play, if you see any of that, you'll notice that my right hand is doing a lot more of the heavy lifting harmonically while my left hand is always hugging the jaw bars. And I usually like to call the bear claw technique because you're going to literally kind of have your hands like a bear claw, right? And you're going to be kind of palming and moving. And the idea is smooth gradients, okay? So for my fellow organ players, a lot of the common misconception is that you need to set and then play, set and then play. And you can absolutely do that, treating almost like a preset you would on a keyboard with a bunch of tones. However, the, what gives you a lot of dynamic and mobility sonically is think about like your voice, right? You're not gonna go, uh, ah, eh, right? You're not gonna do that. It's gonna sound really awkward, right? Especially like those sounds that just came flying through your speakers, right? What you're going to find is that subtle motion and subtle filter movement, right? So, and then we can get into that with synthesis down, down the line later on in the week. You'll notice that there's this beautiful, like, dynamic and mo movement that can be uh, created with your playing. So let me give you an example. I'm just going to pedal this C chord again. We're in the key of C again, right? And if you think here, we just keep it open with the same four. Right, gives it a little bit of motion, okay? So a lot of the time, also, you probably hear that there's a heavier vibrato at a point and less vibrato. That is something called the Leslie speaker. Now, I'm not hooked up to an actual Leslie. I do have a cool Yamaha RA20. If you're familiar with that, the same amp that Roger Waters used. Um, what you will notice is that there's a difference in your tone, right? Static with a little bit of corral. And if I engage Leslie, you can hear more of the corral and the movement, right? So this is another phrasing thing, in addition to draw bars, is thinking about how do I utilize tonal development as well as like physical air movement right because a leslie if you're unfamiliar has two different moving parts it has the top horn which looks like two giant cones that rotate clockwise or counterclockwise depending on how you rigged your motor and the bottom has a drum which looks like this big wooden cylinder with an open side <clears throat> and the idea is that the speaker is in the top half there's a speaker in the top half which is your tweeter for your treble and then there is a um uh, there is uh, the drum for your lower tone, and they move in opposite directions of each other, and it's literally moving the air, so it gives a natural vibrato, natural chorusing effect, okay? So as doing so, you will be giving yourself more dynamic. So the question is, when is it appropriate to kick in the Leslie? And again, I will get back to the draw bars, but this is all intrinsically um, helps each other out. The answer is whenever you see fit, but I find to be most musical <clears throat> in the moments of excitement and think about adding vibrato to any instrument you play just treat it as vibrato now if you had vibrato going the entire time you lose clarity right it's too much variation right because vibrato technically is bringing a slightly sharp and slightly flat it's a little bit of variance between the two different um areas of intonation this doesn't really affect intonation per se but it does affect the way it blends with the rest of an ensemble so you want to make sure that you want to be um, taking an element of thinking about when it's appropriate to accent. So more often than not, so let's say I'll give you a great like tangible example. Let's say you are accompanying a guitarist, okay? So the guitarist is doing this ripping solo. It's kicking ass and taking names, and you want to bring the band up, right? You want to like, man, let's just like kick it into high gear. That is when you engage the Leslie. So let's say, you know, you are sitting here, you know, just playing, you know, let's just do an F minor chord, right? So we have like this F minor chord. <laughs> And the band's going, right? And bring the button down a little bit. So the band's going really good, right? And so you have it at a stagnant, right? And then if you want to really kick it in. Having that motion, that ramp, what we call the ramp up, right? The speaker getting faster and then the speaker getting slower. It brings in this level of drama and tension, right? So let's talk about now how do we integrate that with a little bit of draw bar motion, okay? So a lot of the time with draw bar movements, we deal with, um, if you listen to like Medeski, <clears throat> right? Great example because he is one of the most dynamic motions of draw bars. Guys like Nigel Hall do it a lot too. 
Um, but if you listen to like Jimmy Smith, he keeps it pretty stagnant. He doesn't move around a lot. Joey DeFrancesco does a lot of motion as well. The real idea is that, again, this is up to you. And the, the best piece of advice I can give you is experiment. Don't feel that you need to always keep it exactly the same. The idea is that the more you mess around and you find your perfect settings, the better you are. Like you can discover this really great one. So I took <clears> – <throat> I have the first one set to uh, all the way open. I have the second one set to about halfway, so like between four and five, give or take. Third and fourth, all the way open. Now check this out. The one, two, three, four, five, sixth one, I'm opening up all the way. This brings a major third above things. So if you really want to mess with people's harmonic sense, right? So normally you would have this sound. That's a C minor. Now watch this. I'm going to throw a major third on it. Sorry, my apologies. I put the wrong jaw bar. Been a long day already. <laughs> I meant to say the seventh jaw bar, the one that is one and three fifths feet that one brings your major third right gives you a really weird gritty tone so if you want to do some really funky bass lines so i'm literally mixing major versus minor which kind of can tie into some of the cool harmonic stuff that i was showing you yesterday but back to draw bar effects right so the big draw bar effect that a lot of people have asked me how do you get this done is the the draw bar squeal right the the sound of like Something like that, right? So really what you're doing is, you gotta remember, go back to what I was talking about, the fundamental before, right? The fundamental is the lowest tone, right? You're very far left draw bar, okay? So what you're going to do, the first step is to remove your fundamental. So if I just play like this, this F minor again, and I remove the fundamental, watch. It sounds much thinner. And this is how you can get some of those really funky Modesky, Martin, and Wood types of sounds because what you're doing is you're still hearing the principal tone. You're still hearing that as an F minor chord or you're still hearing it as C, whatever chord you're playing. But what you end up hearing is the overtones over it rather than just the principal, right? So listen to the difference, right? Here's your F minor without the fundamental. Here's with the fundamental. Let me do a slow open of it. Right? All of a sudden. So that's the first step to doing your draw bar squeal, okay? So you have to make sure that you are removing the fundamental. And the other way of getting it is making sure you engage the Leslie in the beginning. Now, I use a foot switch for my Leslie. I don't use a half moon switch um, because I do a lot of left hand bass, which I will be getting to in a few moments here. So I have, uh, you can't really see, but I do have a foot board down here. Cody Urban built me this pedal board, and I'll probably show you some stuff when I get into synthesis of the really cool pedal board for all my synths that Cody built, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, so thank you, Cody. We love you, man. Um, we want to make sure that you are comfortable in coordinating your efforts. So if you're using Half Moon, Half Moon is usually right here on the keyboards on the bottom left hand. It's a toggle switch that moves from left to right. Uh, for me, it, I just have a foot switch. I'm basically just using a repurposed sustain pedal that I've just set the polarity correct so it's on off just click it it's engaged click it again it's shut off okay so when you're doing a squeal you want to make sure that you are engaging the leslie while you are also bringing in the upper partials right the upper register while rolling off left so you almost want to think about making a wave right so if you're open you're going to be closing it up and opening the top right and to then do a reverse you close the top and open the bottom so it's the idea of you're thinking of a parabolic curve when you're doing this okay now there's some other ways of doing like faster you go like <laughs> The problem with that, though, is that it doesn't sound musical, and it really doesn't su serve the, uh, the correct tone when you're thinking about it, right? Because the idea is that most role of the organ, unless you're soloing, is you are the glue, right? You're playing all the mid-range harmonies that a lot of the other instruments try to do, but you're kind of gelling it all together. So you have to make sure that your motions are smooth. That's what gives it the most effect. Now, they can be fast, but they have to be smooth. That's the key. Okay, so when you're doing this, right, so let me show you, we do this F minor chord, right, starting on with the four, open, engage the Leslie, and slowly start sweeping the bottom. Okay, now let me do a little bit faster, a little less exaggerated. Now, another way of doing it is you do a palm slide up to it to make it super dramatic, right, palm slide, literally, you are using your palm. Um, some of you, if you see my hands after shows, my hands are swollen because I beat the living crap out of my hands. Don't do that. That's not the best technique. But a palm slide, quite literally, you're going to start at the bottom, and you're going to slide up and land on your chord. Okay, So you're going to start at the bottom, and we're going to engage the Leslie halfway through your glissando. Remember, glissando means a slide, right? Just like, <coughs> that's a glissando. Everyone loves to do that. Why not, right? If you take one thing away, you learned how to do a glissando today. So we're going to take my left hand, okay? So your left hand's going to be doing two jobs. Your left hand's going to be rolling the chord upwards or rolling the scale upwards and then it's going to jump immediately to the draw bars now if you're dealing with a full console hammond b3 or an a100 or anything or an m3 or anything like that you'll have a little bit more distance to the draw bars than my sk2 here so you might just have to lean 
Luckily, I'm a small dude, so I have a smaller keyboard. Those of you who are normal size, you will be totally fine. So watch, um, once I reach about roughly here, which is your B flat below middle C, that's when the Leslie's gonna engage. I'm gonna land on the chord. I'm gonna roll the bottoms and bring the highs up, okay? So watch. And the idea is a quick let go, right? You don't want it to linger, because if it lingers, you have this very tinny tone. Now, if that's the sound you're going for, by all means, if it fits the tone of the song or anything you're doing, that makes absolute and perfect sense. However, you have to think about timbral values, right? Timbre, T-I-M-B-R-E, spelled like timbre. Timbre means like the quality or the value of tone. So does it sound rich? Does it sound tinny? Does it sound warm? Does it sound dark, right? It's about throwing a bunch of different colors and adjectives and all that stuff together to describe the quality or essence of your sound. So when you're dealing with that, you want to make sure that you're releasing quickly, and then you can keep re-attacking it, but you don't want to be holding it unless you close the signal off. So as a result, closing the signal off, okay, when you do that, you gain, your, you gain the same effect, and you don't have to let go of your right hand. So let me show you another example. So just turn the Leslie off, let it wind down, and then you do this. Right? So not only was I letting go, but I was also moving the drawbars. So once I close the drawbars, there's no signal, right? But I have to open it to create signal to come through, okay? So, when you're working through that, that is the way you do draw bar squeals, okay? Another fun effect, just to show you, um, is if you remove the fundamental and you bring up the, the higher principle, right, and that, I haven't even engaged the percussion. When you engage the percussion, it gives you something different. So that gives you a little bit more of like a pseudo presence type of sound, right? So this is that's kind of your first wave of sound design. So to kind of recap before I move on to some left hand bass stuff, when you are building your tones, right, your fundamental is your very first one, and it builds your natural overtone series. There are some incredible um, charts online that you can actually see like the sheet music of the um, the way your harmony is stacked. Definitely recommend doing that, um, you know, especially if you have some time to just look at it and you know how to read music. Other than that, really, just use your ear. Um, a lot of my organ technique came from transcription, um, and we can talk about transcription um, maybe tomorrow or the day after, because I'm, again, I'm going to try to do this every day. This will help me keep me sane and active, my brain working and everything. Um, but when you are working through um, tone design with this, right, this is different than sound design with synthesis, experiment. See what you like and look at the numbers, right? Most draw bars are numbered. Mine are numbered 8 through 1 from the top being most open down to 0, obviously being closed. Um, some of them, if you have a Nord, they're more visually. They're like little LED lights. Same principle. You can get away with that. If you have like a Viscount, that can do the same thing. Um, there are a bunch of other ones out there too. So they're all kind of doing the same thing. Um, but realistically, uh, just don't be afraid to experiment, right? You can like bring out different sounds and get... But again, it's all about smoothness. It's all about thinking about almost as if you are a human voice, right? Keep contour and keep shape. Let's talk about left-hand bass line. So bassists, this can apply to you too. And don't worry, I'm not trying to steal your jobs. As <laughs> some of you have said that I try to do, well, hey, my left hand likes to do some bass lines, right? So let's use a 12-bar blues as our example today, right? So those of you who don't know, a 12-bar blues is 12 measures. Bar is just a synonym for measure. Um, 12 bar blues is one of the oldest Western traditions, um, stem from the slave trade and everything. If you can look up the history, I can get into that at a later time. But it's a 12 bar repeating pattern. Now, the typical pattern, uh, let's use the key of B flat because I'm a horn player. I love the key of B flat. Okay, so the key of B flat. So your first chord is your B flat. Then it goes to your four chord, your E flat. Then it goes back to your B flat. Now, if we're doing a bird blues, now, some of you might talk about there's two different versions of bird blues. Bird, Charlie Parker, great bebop saxophonist. Um, he has two different versions. He does one with the added turnarounds at the end. Then he does one like the song Blues for Alice, which is more of like a major blues um, where it goes to the sixth chord. We're not going to do the Blues for Alice style bird blues. We're going to do just your typified reharmonization bird blues, which is just like Billy's Bounce if you're looking for, or Now's the Time, if you're looking for actual concrete examples, okay? So when we have our blues, it goes from the one chord to the four chord, back to the one chord. Now you can talk about there's a turnaround to get you the four chord. You can go... Five minor, one dominant, two, four dominant, which is your E flat dominant, to your E f diminished, to your B flat, then three, which is a D minor, six, to two, which is C minor, to five, which is F dominant seven, to one, which is B flat. So, in looking at that, right, the question is, all right, I have that, I have... Right now, if I do that, it's not very exciting. Now, if there's a bassist, obviously, all I would be charge of, in charge of is just making sure that the chords sound 
cohesive, right? But let's talk about being a self-sufficient organ player, right? Most organ players will use foot pedals. I do not have enough space in my home studio here to use foot pedals, so that's why I've trained myself in my left-hand bass. So the best way to do it is making sure you understand the chord value and the scale value of every single chord. So that means knowing your modality, right? Ionian, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian, Aeolian, Locrian. And I'll get into that actually probably tomorrow, talking about the circle of force as I was referencing yesterday. So when you're dealing with a walking bass line, you're almost thinking like you're playing scales, right? So the easiest way to start with is just run your scale. So we start with B flat. But that's a little too busy, right? So we're going to cut down and we're going to keep minimum. So the best way to think about it is listen to your favorite bassist. Listen to Jock Pastorius. Listen to Paul Chambers. Listen to pretty much anybody who can walk. Ron Carter is a, like the one that I would transcribe a lot of. And that's how I learned a lot of my left-hand bass lines is I would just turn on jazz records and oh, like really focus my listening on the bassist. And as a result, by listening to the bassist, I would sit there and transcribe what they were doing. Now, obviously, I have to take some liberties because... One, I am not a bassist, but two, there's only so much range that I have because the bass can go slightly lower, okay? So as a result, what you have to think about is the feel, right? Time is of the utmost importance. You can sit there and play the coolest notes in the world, but if you're out of time, unfortunately, it's not going to swing or it's not going to groove if depending on what style of music you're playing. In this case, we're thinking more on the swing side because it's the blues. The other thing to think about is rhythmic diversity. If you only swing quarter notes, it's kind of boring, but think about, like, if you listen... Right, those old little hiccups, like ticket don don't don't get to right? Those little what we call like hiccups. I don't know what you call them. If you have a technical term, please let me know. But when you're looking through a lot of that, right, you have to think about how would my left hand be a bassist, right? You are no longer a pianist that happens to be playing bass. You are now a bassist in your left hand and you are a pianist or organist or keyboardist in your right hand. So it's a different role, right? You have to think about cross disciplinary. How do I sit there and kind of treat myself as a secondary musician. So let me play just a 12 bar blues to show you. I'm just going to comp chords in my right hand and I'm just going to walk a bass line in my left hand so you can get an example. Right? So if you hear, right, there's a lot going on. And I'm sure if you've never experienced that, you're like, oh my goodness, how am I supposed to do that? We start really simple, right? You start with the roots, okay? And again, this is kind of going back to like not the most exciting thing, but we got to start somewhere. We have to start with the foundation and then we can get really exciting and really experimental, right? You start with chord notes. And I'm just playing roots. So that's E flat to B flat. And I'm going to skip that turn around B flat. We go to E flat. Now to E diminished. B flat. Now to D. G. C, F, B flat, G, C, F, back to B flat, right? Now, that's not very exciting, but you have to start somewhere. You have to get your coordination between your two hands, okay? So in doing so, right, then you start adding, like, I'm just doing the first three notes of the scale, right? And I'm stripping away the rest of the blues right now just to show you how simple that bass line is without the turnarounds. Okay? Now, when you start getting fancier, again, it's a matter of knowing your scale. So you need to know your B-flat mixolydian. You need to know your E-flat mixolydian. You need to know your E-diminished scale. You need to know all your different scales and all the different values of those. Because what ends up happening is you gain more confidence and diversity the deeper you know your harmony. So treat it like learning your ABCs. Is it the most exciting thing to learn? Absolutely not. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. But knowing your scales, knowing your circle force, and knowing your mod modes of major, and we'll get into modes of minor too. That's a whole cool thing. That's where you get your fun altered scales and things like that. That's how you can like justify chords like this in the blues, right? But by doing so, you gain a deeper sense of what notes can fit and what notes can be used as passing tones. Passing tones meaning, literally, how do I get from one note to the next in the most logical and most... Uh, like nice sound, right? So let me show you. Oh, Frank, you're asking about ghost notes. Yes, ghost notes are like hiccups, kind of like a hiccup. Um, just like, you know, uh, it, it, a ghost note, for those of you who are unfamiliar, if you look at uh, any writing that's non-drum music, there's usually an X that represents it. It's almost like you swallow a note. Um, and in doing so, um, I can show you, I'm going to actually do something on the saxophone probably in the next day or so. I just need to test levels for that. Um, and that's a little bit easier to show you. So ghost notes or breathing techniques through ghosting, um, on a keyboard instrument, it's a little bit different. Um, because an organ doesn't have weighted keys, uh, depending on like how hard you hit it, it doesn't matter. Like I'm slamming on this and 
there's no difference and I'm Aww. barely touching it. There's no difference. It's on my foot. It's a it's a toggle switch. It's almost like a wah wah pedal for you guys who are familiar with that. Like quiet Aww. to loud, right? So it's a it's a pitch. So when you're doing ghost notes, it's a matter of really light attack. So instead of going, you go. So I'm using my index finger there more percussively, right? It's really quick. So it's like it's not actually like a fully articulated tone. And what that does is that gives the essence of almost like when a bassist or guitarist palm mutes something or they don't fully articulate their attack, right? The attack, the way the note is hit, okay? So bringing it back, how do we tie this all in together, right? When you deal with your blues, we're going to walk that bass line, but we're going to think of the full articulated scales or some element of a full articulated scale. And then we're going to also think about how to... Um, bring in the chords. Now, I'll also talk about comping rhythms in my right hand momentarily before we part ways, and I'll leave you guys for the day so I can go start some of my virtual lessons online. And yes, I do one-on-one -on -one lessons as well, so if you guys are at all interested, please just drop me a message. I have tons of free time now, <laughs> as, as a lot of us do, so please do not make yourself a stranger. If you just want even 15 minutes just to, like, ask a question, I am at your, at your service, so please make yourself, uh, make yourself, uh, you know, not a stranger because I, I love teaching. I love the process of sharing this because I think we all should be teaching each other our tricks because, hey, man, how do we grow, right? It's the old tradition, right? So let's go back to the walking bass line, right? So we're going to think in uh, B-flat blues with the bird turnarounds minus the turnaround on bar four going into the four chord. And again, I can always write out like charts for you guys and like upload them if that's of interest if you're more of a visual learner. All right, so check this out. We're going to walk that bass line, right? And listen to the way my rhythm goes in my bass line, and then I'll talk about comping rhythms in my right hand to end our little lesson today. All right, check this out. Okay, so there's like a, an example of how to walk through a 12-bar blues. Now, let's end today by talking about what do you do with your right hand, right? So you're focusing so much on your left hand, and the tendency is just kind of land on the chord like... It's perfect. you got to start somewhere, right? we got to make sure that you are keeping yourself in a realm of comfort before you start going past, right? The idea in learning, whether you are 80 years old or 8 years old, is boost your confidence first, right? A lot of young players... I have an easier time with that because we don't, they don't have a filter, right? But as the older we get, we know what music is supposed to sound like, so we kind of roadblock ourselves because we're like, oh, man, you know, that doesn't sound like the way that I'm supposed to have it sound. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Mistakes are where genius lies, right? Really think about that. Mistakes are where discoveries happen. If, if I could count how many mistakes I've made on stage, then you guys would be shocked, right? It's a matter of turning the mistake into correctness because there's no wrong notes, guys. And, I can, and that's what we're going to talk about actually tomorrow is outside playing. Um, and that's where we can really show you the justification of wrong versus right notes in that regard. So to end today, let's talk about comping rhythms. Comping is short for accompanying, right? Accompanying rhythms in our right hand. Think about having a conversation with yourself. If your left hand is taking on the... Um, if your left hand is taking on like the rhythmic lead, if you will, right, significantly more notes, think about like how you would interject, oh, that's interesting, oh, yeah, right, you know, actually engaged in a conversation, not the passive listening that we sometimes do with each other, right, and the idea is that it's back and forth, your left hand's the driving force in this, right, because it's the bass line, and your right hand is more of like this interjection, right, it's almost like if someone's like, hey, isn't that, isn't that cool, You're like, yeah, man, that's cool, right, that's the idea, right, you're not going to try to talk over each other, right, now sometimes that can be appropriate. Sometimes that can add this level of tension and release. But realistically, we want to try to make sure that we are keeping as much of a um, <clears throat> as much of like a, a fair dynamic between the two. So I usually like to think of off beats. Off beats for those of you who don't know. On beat is when you clap like one, two, three, four. And off beat is one and 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 right it's the in between the claps right off the beat right or the upbeat depending on the way you think about it okay and this kind of ties in with ghosting and hiccups and all that fun stuff too so the idea is that you want to keep it simple like see it's off beat right so that's not that exciting so you want to do less right the idea is less is more in everything we do right we have a tendency to oversaturate because we live in that kind of era of musical evolution i'm just as guilty as any of you know i play a ton of notes right but the idea is how do you hold back <coughs> pardon me how do you make sure that you are not 
uh, oversaturating with too much information. And by thinking less is more, that's really the way to do it, okay? So when you're thinking about that, you have this beautiful opportunity to create a little bit of a back and forth. Right? And to add to this as our last little bit, there was one point where you're probably like, wait, man, but you're holding out a note for a long time with the other thing. This deals with common tone voicings, right? Basically finding that one magical note that can fit over things. So it, honestly, it's a matter of, again, it's really diving into your harmony. And I can spend a really great lesson on showing you some harmonic ideas a little bit more deep than the tritone sub I did yesterday. So when you're looking at that, you have this opportunity to find a note. So watch. So I'm holding out G. Why is that G work? G is the sixth note above B flat or the 13th, where you think about it's 13, right? Flat seven, three, 13. The G is the 11, I'm um, sorry, the G is the third, my apologies, thinking D minor for some reason. The G is the uh, third of your E flat dominant and also the third of your E diminished. The G is also the fifth of C minor, the ninth of F, and then it's also the 11th when we get to the actual turnaround, three, six, right? It's the 11th of D minor, it's the root of G, and then it's the ninth of F, and it goes back. So that's another way to think about it. So, hopefully this imparted a little bit of wisdom on your gray and dreary day. I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to try to do it roughly around the same time, assume like 12 to 1.30. Really, it's a matter of when my beautiful daughter decides to go down for a nap and if I have some stuff to do around the house. Um, thank you all again. Seriously, it's awesome seeing, I mean, man, there's been a good amount of you tuning into this thing. What, a, what an honor. Seriously, you guys uh, make me love what I do. Um, I hope you guys have a good day. Uh, stay positive. And I will see you all uh, tomorrow. And tune in. I think Cody's going to probably do another live stream tonight. So, again, share each other's live streams. Let's boost each other up. We're all in this together. Let's grow from this. Hey, we might start a new wave of musical revolution. You guys never know. So have a fantastic day. I'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks so much, guys.